Hey there, folks. Welcome to Spectrum Pulse. We talk about music, movies, art, and culture. And today, we are finally going to be talking about the newest album from Rustin Kelly, his debut album, Dying Star. So look, I had my reasons for not getting to this for a while. Yes, I had seen some of the critical acclaim. I had heard the hype from folks in my circle and group chats. And I'll admit the naturally suspicious side of me was overruling all of it. For those of you who don't know, Rustin Kelly is an indie country artist who put in a lot of work as a songwriter behind the scenes for the Josh Abbott Band and Tim McGraw before releasing his debut EP, Halloween, last year, which got him a deal on Rounder Records and the traction for this debut as well. What some might know him better for though is his high profile marriage to Casey Musgraves, who with the critical acclaim and the major Grammy nominations for Golden Hour is having a banner year of her own. And yes, fairly or not, that did mean I was naturally suspicious of any of the critical hype here, especially given that some of his recent career traction was likely driven off of some of that connection. Hell, her backing vocals are on the album. Nevertheless, given that he is still independent for now, the hype still hasn't quite translated to commercial traction the same way outside of rave critical reviews. And even then, there are a few indie country outlets that seemed a little wary of him too, so figure it's near the end of the year, why not give this a chance? So what do we get on Dying Star? So here's a strange thing. I've been re-listening to Dying Star damn near constantly ever since I started putting together this review, almost to the point where I didn't actually want to put the review down because that would mean I'd have to move on to listen to something else. And yeah, that means we're hitting the point where my assumptions going in were spectacularly wrong because not only is Dying Star among one of the best country albums of the year, if not the best, it's handily better than Golden Hour across the board and highlights a lot of the elements that I kind of wish were on that album. Hell, it might as well be one of the best debut albums of the entire year, bringing this sort of fully formed confidence balanced out with raw emotive vulnerability that resonates incredibly deeply with me, especially in 2018. This is an album caught up in the throes of bleary-eyed burnout that can't trust itself to make the right decisions, but is still trying to make something work regardless. And if that doesn't characterize my 2018, I don't know what does. And we have to start off with Rustin Kelly himself. And honestly, while I was immediately on board with some of his vocal timbre, I can see why some would be a little bit more hesitant. The most immediate comparisons within country are Evan Felker's The Turnpike Troubadours or Jason Isbell's slightly flatter, more nasal delivery where you can tell he's making the best of a limited range, but his belting also recalls a little bit of Marcus Mumford and the hangdog delivery definitely recalls some Ryan Adams or early Frank Turner. And while the tighter multi-tracking on the opening song Cover My Tracks will be perfectly agreeable to most people and I can't imagine anybody will complain about the subtle backing vocals from Casey Musgraves, Joy Williams, Natalie Hemby, and Caitlin Smith creeping across certain songs like Just For The Record and Blackout and Jericho. What will surprise a lot of listeners is Son Of A Highway Daughter, which opens up with the sort of acapella piece overlaid with a vocoder that recalls nothing more than Imogen Heap's Hide and Seek from over a decade ago. And what's stunning is how well it actually works. And I'm honestly not sure how the hell he pulled it off. I came down pretty hard when Amanda Shires tried a similar tactic on To The Sunset earlier this year, but for Rustin Kelly, it only seems to intensify the weird, echoing loneliness that characterizes the majority of this album, and because possibly for the first time, a vocoder has been used well stylistically in country music. And part of it likely comes down to Rustin Kelly's style of delivery and his vocal cadence. There's a yearning heart to his overextended nasal tones of delivery that's not a natural fit to belting, so even echo by a vocoder, his natural timbre still manages to cut through and feel distinctive. He's not overrun by the effect. And when accented by the acoustic rustling groove, the pedal steel, and the touches of piano, it feels cohesive and natural in a really fantastic way. And really, the fact that Rustin Kelly can get away with such a production trick is emblematic to his approach to melodic composition and production as a whole here. Warm acoustics right at the front with firm pedal steel supplementing the melody where needed, along with some touches of shimmer tremolo patterns at the very back, some live sandy drums and supple bass grooves, but never to the point of feeling overstated, the pianos and hints of organ for some accent pieces, and when he wants to push in a solo, that harmonica will come out blaring and it sounds great. But what really won me over very fast was Kelly's focus on mixed dynamics and the composition. And there's a subtlety to some otherwise straightforward tones, or even melodies 
that I really admire. Take a song like Mockingbird and how it builds to that natural crescendo, to that harmonica, before the verses even begin. It's a great way to open up the song. Or the subtle touches of atmosphere to set the mood on Paratrooper's battle cry. Or how a song like Faceplant isn't afraid to take a conventional country melody structure on the verses before flipping things into a slightly darker hook and it really works. And this embrace of consistent tones as a whole, but indulging in some subtlety allows him to incorporate, say, some indie rock leaning backing vocals behind Big Brown Bus without feeling out of place. Or the twinkling tones, the subtle harmonica and brittle acoustics that lets anchors drift into ghostly territory that easily resembles the windswept seaside within the lyrics. Or even the supple beauty of trying to let her, with the hints of oily synth sounding just alien enough to make sense of the new feelings compared to the more familiar downbeat pedal steel. And then there's the title track, with which is firmer bass presence and the spare acoustics. It almost recalls a Lori McKenna song like The Lot Behind St. Mary's, and it is all the better for it. It's got that supple foundation that sounds fantastic and really subtle in a great way. That being said, after an absolutely stellar seven songs opening up the project, I will say that there are a few cuts on the album that can feel a little bit unfinished or could have used at least afford another verse or a hook. Mercury probably springs to mind as the weakest cut here, and while Brightly Burst Into the Air was intentionally short, kind of given the subject matter, it makes sense, it's great enough of a song that it could have easily gotten a second verse or a bridge or something to really blow up effectively. I really like that song. But great production and phenomenal melodies, they will only get you so far if the content isn't there, and if there's an area where Rustin Kelly cements himself as a presence to be reckoned with, it is here. Now granted, within indie country, we've all heard plenty of songs about sad sack guys on the outskirts who are in the midst of a downward spiral, but it's usually coupled with some sort of swaggering bravado, or the framing is that this is some sort of spiritual test and you're going to hell regardless, or that's all being done in order to test somebody's love for somebody else. The archetypal example of this is Matt Woods' excellent song, Dead Man's Blues. At least that's what it is to me in the 2010s. But what makes Rustin Kelly so damn intriguing is that there really isn't that sort of broader framing. And the attempts at grandeur of long faded, the scope is noticeably smaller, and with the production only sporadically indulging in more bombast, it serves to make many of these songs feel much more grounded and human, for lack of better words. He's not tearing off on a bike or a sports car or a pickup truck, he's taking the big brown bus just like everybody else. And this isn't somebody on the cusp of disaster for the first time. No, what makes Dying Star hit so damn hard is that our frontman has long accepted his ruin in drugs and alcohol and misspent relationships. But it never feels precisely hopeless or nihilistic either. His golden years might be fluttering by on Cover My Tracks, but his surprise comes that he's able to get back to normal time and time again. You almost get the impression he would have wished for worse, but worse isn't quite coming. And even if it was, he'd survive, he'd make it through, he'd get what is coming to it, but he'd make it through. That's what makes Paratrooper's Battle Cry such a stirring song, written from the perspective of a veteran abandoned by everybody and trying to heal from his PTSD. The faded heroism still gives the song a glimmer to keep him going, and the swell of the production just nails it so well. And yet if you think all this is playing merry hell on his relationships, well, obviously. But it's very telling that Rustin Kelly is self-aware enough to be bluntly honest about who is even drawn to men like him on Mockingbird, along with a healthy slice of guilt for it, which manifests most strongly on Anchors, where he has to let her go. And then, not shying away from the consequences of this lifestyle, like on Faceplant. And that's not saying that he's immune from heartbreak, either. Blackout shows exactly how men like him cope, and none of it is healthy. Honestly, cut probably deeper than it should. And if I were to highlight a flaw here, it'd be that the single cover song on this album, Just For The Record, where the writing just isn't quite as poetic and its post-breakup musings doesn't quite get there. But what gives Dying Star its true gut punch comes in the final four songs, most because it does give a glimpse of hope for something that can be real and stable, as Rustin Kelly can be more than the broken man that characterized the rest of the album, but he has to allow himself to feel enough worth to be loved and to be capable of moving beyond the past that he's never truly cut free 
despite his wanderings. Indeed, he gets how much of that hangdog exterior can be a defensive mechanism against real emotional vulnerability. And while he's left enough doors open to let something in, it's his fight to not be crushed by the weight of his own soul. It's a trying one indeed. And I really admire how this album doesn't hit a straight answer either and it's ending on the final song where he retraces those old haunts. You're not going to get all the answers. You will get what's coming to you, but that sort of life, it's not a burnout trace. Just a burst into the air. Maybe forgotten, but leaving enough light to linger in the sky and inspire a whisper or two of what was left behind. And you know what? Sometimes, for those of us, it can be enough. So in short, too late. Again, I was way too late to the ballpark with this album. Rustin Kelly's Dying Star isn't just one of the best debuts of the year. It's the sort of project that entrenches a new artist in the scene with a defined style in writing and execution that deserves a ton of attention. I'm not sure it's the sort of project that leaves much room for repetition. I'm not sure you can make this album again. But Dying Star does such a powerful job in setting its scene and drawing forth emotion that it's won enough goodwill for me to see whatever the hell he goes next. And in case you can't tell, 9 out of 10, the highest of my recommendations, and absolutely a project that needs to be heard by a lot more people in country or otherwise before the end of this year. If you haven't heard this, yeah, stop wasting time, check this out. My god, so worth it. So yeah, thanks a lot for watching. Like to like and subscribe, I'd be more than grateful. Yes, I know I'm late to the crunch with this, but oh my god, it is such a good album. I'm so happy I got a chance to cover it before the end of the year. Kind of preempted my schedule to do so, but yeah, so worth it. You want to buy or stream it? Highly recommend you do. Link's down there below. And I got the poll up there. Well, hell, I know a lot of people who have heard this album just rave about it. But if you think otherwise, the poll's there for y'all to tell me how wrong I am. Kind of looking forward to it. Beyond that, anything else I might be able to do to improve my presentation, I'm all ears. And if you guys want to get involved in my scheduling process so I could have covered this album three months ago, link to my Patreon right over there, where three times a week you guys get to vote on my schedule, and once a week for the higher tier contributors, you guys get to add albums, movies, or even a top ten list to that schedule. More details right there. If you want to see my schedule, it's on my Instagram, link down there below. But till then, I'm Mark, you're watching Spectrum Pulse, and I'll see you next time.